So artificial intelligence is all the buzz right now. But before we can get into how brick and mortar owners like you and me can use artificial intelligence and apply it to the physical retail space, it helps to understand the types of problems artificial intelligence can solve. And before we can do that, it really helps to understand how artificial intelligence works. Now, before we can get into the ways artificial intelligence works, we have to understand what intelligence is. Okay, I know that's a lot, but follow me on this one. What's the definition of intelligence? The ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. Intelligence is the ability to take information and apply it to solve a problem or reach a desired outcome. Intelligence falls into two big buckets. One, natural intelligence, and two, artificial intelligence. The only source of natural intelligence we're aware of today is that of the brain. Now, not just the human brain, any brain. See, brains are built for taking information and using it to try to maximize the positive outcome, be it solving a problem or reproduction. Then it's built to take what it learned from that experience and apply it to make better decisions in the future. So to put it very simply, brains are pattern recognizers and prediction machines. Those of you who are parents have learned this firsthand. Even I was surprised with how little my daughter knew out of the gate. At least deer kind of know how to walk when they're born. But Junie, she didn't even know how to fart. See, when she was born, her movements seemed almost random. Legs kicking, arms flailing. But then something amazing happened. She began to understand the things she needed to do to get the outcome she wanted through uh, repeated trial and error. She was able to start to get what she wanted by acting certain ways. Junie, where are you? Okay. In artificial intelligence land, we call this reinforcement learning. Let's dive a little bit more into this trial and error process. But we're not gonna dive too deep because you don't need to know all the details to really understand it. Picture this. Picture your brain as layers of connected neurons. And when signal comes in to your brain from one of your senses, the sight, sound, touch, smell, the pathways that these signals take is determined by which pathways are the strongest. And when you get what you want out of it, when you get your uh, positive feedback, the pathway that the signal took is reinforced. So the next time it happens, the next time you find yourself in similar circumstances, the next time you feel hunger, the next time you feel sadness, the next time you feel something that you need or you experience a discomfort, your brain is gonna use all of these inputs, fire all these patterns that it has in the past to come up with what it thinks is the best way to resolve that discomfort. So you repeat this thousands and thousands of times a day for years and years and even decades and your brain gets really good at determining what circumstances are gonna result in discomfort or pain and what circumstances are gonna result in happy, feel good, fun times. This is the basis for intuition. When someone says, trust your gut, what they're really saying is trust your pattern recognizer. And all that's really happening is that your brain is receiving certain inputs and it's firing common pathways just enough that you recognize the pattern, but you might not necessarily know why you recognize the pattern. That's the feeling of deja vu and just how intuition works in general. So now that we have a basic understanding of natural intelligence and pattern recognition, let's get into artificial intelligence. For our intent, artificial intelligence breaks down into two categories. One, hard-coded intelligence, and two, machine learning through the use of neural networks. So let's just start with the most common type of intelligence. This is hard-coded intelligence. This is a type of computer system that we use all the time. When you put in data into an Excel spreadsheet and you write all your equations and you get all your outputs, that's using information to determine an answer. That's, our, that's intelligence. It's just you hard-coded the rules. The most prolific example of hard-coded intelligence is IBM Deep Blue. It's the machine that IBM built to beat Gary Kasparov in chess in 1997. And here's what's interesting, is Deep Blue didn't understand the concept of chess, not like you and I do. It just was programmed with all the rules of chess and then through sheer processing power could calculate two million potential moves every second. And just by brute forcing was able to beat the best human. And the best human can't compute two million possible moves every second because the best human doesn't need to. In this case, in playing chess, Hard-coded intelligence is not very efficient. 
In a lot of cases, it's testing moves that no grandmaster would ever check, but because we have this processing power, we can just check all these moves. Now, we can apply hard-coded intelligence to the retail space today. In fact, we already do. It's all around us. Like when someone makes a purchase and you ask if you want to print a receipt, you print a receipt. That's making decisions. Now, the decisions are very basic and they're hard-coded, but still they're valuable. They add value to the interaction. You know the, the email that's sent out after someone makes a purchase, if they want an email receipt, or even an alert that's sent out when someone's scheduled for more than 40 hours a week. These are all examples of hard-coded intelligence that we use every day. And what's great is we can take the thousands of years of experiences humans have in retail, apply the rules to machines, and let machines run them day by day, second by second. But where artificial intelligence gets really exciting is machine learning and neural networks. See, in machine learning, the engineers build the computer not to solve a particular task necessarily, but to actually learn how to solve the particular task. And they do it by creating and simulating the neural networks just like what we talked about with natural intelligence. And honestly, using this strategy, computers have done amazing things. And one of my favorite examples is AlphaGo, the computer that DeepMind, a Google subsidiary, built to play the game of Go. And this is such a big deal because of how much more complicated Go is than chess. At any given time on a chessboard, there are 10 to the 120 possible combinations and positions that could be on the board. And with Go, there's 10 to the 175 possible positions. Now, that might not seem like much. Let me put it a different way. That Go has 1 million trillion 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 more possible board combinations than chess. You can't brute force that. You can't have deep blue calculate all possible moves. You would need a computer the size of the universe that was around for the lifetime of the universe to calculate all that. It's, it is physically impossible, but through machine learning, it can be done. And here lies the magic of neural networks. See, with the neural network, the engineers can feed in the current board configuration and the signals that pass through the neural network will be the ones that in the past best match those of success. What this means is that the computer only has to run a fraction of the possible moves because it has some intuition about what the next move should be in order to maximize the chance of winning. It might be that the computer hasn't seen this configuration of the board, but it's seen enough configurations of the board and played enough and knows enough about the outcomes to reasonably predict with some amount of confidence what to do next to win. Now this is awesome, but neural networks have a major downside and it's that they need a lot of data to get good at what they're doing. I mean, a lot of data. Where a professional Go player can gain a new insight and in one instant change their strategy and, and become better, neural network can't. A neural network has to learn that lesson 10, 100, thousands, thousands of times. It takes a lot of data and a lot of input and a lot of reinforcement to get them good at what you're trying to get them to do. And herein lies the rub. How do we take a machine that can predict the future, but that requires loads and loads and loads of data and lots and lots and lots of training? And how, how do we take that and how do we apply it to the physical retail space? You've got image recognition, so we've got time series, and you've got natural language processing. So starting with image recognition, yep, we've all seen the face outline on Facebook or on your iPhone where it selects faces, but the coolest, most practical use case in retail I've seen was at Home Depot. I picked up a screw, but I forgot to note how much the screw costs and there wasn't a tag on it. And when I brought it up to the cashier, she asked if I remember the price and I said I didn't. And so she whipped out her own smartphone and pulled up the Home Depot app and took a photo of the screw and turned and said, which one was this? And it was amazing, but there's a catch. She didn't find the right screw. In fact, the screws that she found were about 10 times more expensive than the screw that I wanted. And so I had to go back and take a photo of from where I got the screw and bring it back to her. And for my trouble, she actually gave me a discount. And so here's the lesson, is that the machines, they're gonna get it wrong. But what Home Depot did was right. Two things they did right. Firstly, they used the technology practically in a way that added value immediately. And secondly, they had policies in place that assumed it could go wrong. So when it did go wrong, and I had to go out of my way to make the correction, they made it right. 
time series, be able to predict the future just for predicting what inventory you need when is a great example or what products you might like based off products you've purchased in the past. Then you have natural language processing and the biggest examples of this are Siri or Google Home or Alexa where you, you can say words and understand, give commands. A good example of natural language processing is the ability to go out on the internet and read reviews that people are leaving about your brand and understanding are they good, are they positive? What's the sentiment? What's the idea? What are things and people saying? These are things that humans can't do because there just might be too many reviews. And then there are chatbots, the ability to engage with one of your guests through a machine. And my favorite example of a chatbot is actually the one that we built at my wife's shop, Spruce, to help our guests and clients book appointments, shaves, haircuts. And here's what's interesting. We built this bot back in 2015. We were the first ones to build a bot that allowed people to book appointments through the Facebook bot platform. But we learned something very valuable. We learned that people have much less patience for machines than they do humans. So we actually built the bot that as soon as you got off what we called happy path, and the bot couldn't understand what you were saying, we immediately asked the person if they wanted to talk to a human. And let me tell you, that saved us a lot of headaches because you've all been on the phone with the bank and gone through the automated teller system. Tell me you love that? No, you absolutely hate it. When you have machines interfacing with your guests, building a way for those guests to get to a human as quickly as possible if they need to, or you're gonna upset a lot of your guests. But what if you don't have big data? What if you're not a big organization? What if you're an SMB or a smaller middle market company? Well, you have options there too take models that other companies have trained or that software companies have built and you can apply those or you can find other companies similar to yours and you can pull your data together anonymize your data and pull it together and use it to train those models so the models will be more applicable to your business and your demographic the use cases for artificial intelligence go on and on and on as long as you have a few things copious amounts of data and you know what you want as an outcome or you could use hard-coded intelligence, get there really, really fast, and probably solve a lot of your problems nearly as well, at least at the beginning. So how do you plan to use artificial intelligence? Or how are you using artificial intelligence? Uh, leave a comment below and let's get the conversation started. Sure. I'll talk on the phone, please. Want me to read it? Yeah. Winnie the Pooh and Piglet are friends, and they like to do things together. In spring, they go for a walk in the rain. Till next time.